Coming up on today's podcast, Ford has apparently drawn the short straw, and we're going to get into a little bit of that, and boy, are we ever. And speaking of Ford, Ford seems to be a little more worried about charging Teslas than they are providing their own EVs with propulsion. Jay's got a little bit of an Apple AirPod scandal, and amidst a part shortage that has been going on forever and ever and ever, it seems like, GM is taking matters into their own hands, and we'll talk about that in depth. And then guess what? What? Rivian. What? Rivian. Rivian. Rivian loses another leader. All that coming up on today's podcast right after this. The Counter Show. We're back after a long hiatus. My good friend Keith is over on the other side of the desk. How you doing, Keith? Now the world don't move to the beat of this one drum. What might be right for you may not be right for some. Whew, my disposition has completely changed now. <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? Exactly. I feel better already, man. I feel like I'm I'm golden. I'm golden. Wow. Um it's amazing man, it's been how a, bad the audio was on those TV shows in the '80s. Oh, I know it, man. <laughs> but thank goodness for modern technology, we can make our we can make the audio even better today. So this might um, be a very special episode of the Counter Show. I, I oh, feel like uh, ooh, didn't they ooh, start? That, didn't that start? That all started with different strokes, I think. Right? I mean, I re- it, it was it did like it all did. the parental war. I remember the you know mm-hmm. the, yeah you know that was a that was a groundbreaking show for a yeah. lot of reasons. I mean they. They all you know, as, oh no you yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean they got into you know a lot of really um, you know heavy duty topics that that um, you know they were cutting edge man I mean they did it in the seventies too because you had um, you know all in the family obviously was one of those shows that really took it to the limit with talking about those things in prime time and um, you know it's just kind of amazing to me how we were able to just kind of swallow that and and listen to it and go oh wow what a great lesson good message here so yeah different strokes was one of those shows too they did the same thing had a lot of that dad to dad to child talk discussions where you know you're sitting on the edge of the bed or the edge of the couch just you and the kid and you're just sitting there giving them your giving it your best man even though you don't know what the hell you're talking about <laughs> You're still just trying to give them your best based on what you've been through in your life, right? Let's face it, Jay. Every generation has a gooch. (laughs) Yes. Yes, absolutely, man. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so we've been away a little while. This is, uh, um, I know we've been releasing stuff, but uh, Keith and I have have, have achieved, actually, Keith has achieved more than I have. Um, I'm I'm putting people in the ground, and he's he's reworking our website. Um, Our website has been overhauled. And uh, seems to be working appropriately. We got some new things coming down. We kept telling you that was going to be happening, so stay tuned for a um, uh, an online shopping experience. We hope to have a, maybe a little bit of a merch store up. Don't know how much we're going to do yet, but we're working on the logistics of all that stuff. And thank you, Keith, publicly thanking you for for all the hard work you put in back there, my friend. No Can, problem. Yeah. Are you ever going to let me into the studio? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you let me into the bat cave, we, man. We kind of pioneered the. Uh, I'm trying to get everything out of the studio. That's the, right. That's the. That's I the, know. Um, we we kind of free- pioneered the remote studio platform. Yeah, yeah, we did. I still just like being one on one with you. We have so much fun when we're doing our remote podcast together, like at SEMA and um, also um, you know PRI and a, a few other things. Speaking of SEMA, we will be there. We are registered, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel. That's uh, youtube.com forward slash parts kind of gurus. And you will get uh, some SEMA clips when that happens in um, November. It'll be the uh, first week in November. So be prepared for that. We will be bringing it to you live from Las Vegas, Las Vegas. Um, And how do you say that? Nevada or Nevada? Mm. Tomato or tomato? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, you watching Stranger Things, Jay? I haven't yet. I've, I, I, th- there's so many shows to choose from to watch. I mean, I, I can't keep up with all of it. Uh, there's a, there was a, that state you just mentioned. See, I almost, almost said it. It oh. was in the episode we watched last night. Oh, tomato? Yeah. Oh, Nevada. It happened in <laughs> Nevada. Tomato. Yeah. I get corrected all the time, man. Tell me it's something Nevada. good. So you, you, you had a, you had a little bit of a situation. Uh, so, you kind of made to to the un uninitiated. It sounds mm-hmm. a little bit like maybe you had a you had a funeral over the past few weeks, which yeah. you kind of did, but it was over. It was a COVID situation that you couldn't have it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, unfortunately, I lost lost an aunt and uncle um, last year within eight months of each other. It was not COVID. Um, they were on up in age and um, love you, cousins uh, Jana, Randy, and Ricky. Um, uh, thanks for being a fan of the show. They do listen to this as well. So thanks to you guys. Um, but what I didn't realize is what we had to do, which was uh, they, they, they cremated both of them and they waited until everybody could get together to kind of have this memorial service for both of them at the same time in our hometown. And um, um, they bought the, they had the two urns, but they had to have a vessel to put the urns in to put in the ground we i i took part in digging the the grave um per specification uh by the funeral home uh and the cemetery what they uh what they require for that and uh so it was my first time ever actually physically putting um human remains into a grave um and um it, it was it was quite an experience i was honored to do that for my aunt and uncle put it that way but that's a first for me man I mean, they, you kind of stopped doing that stuff back in the forties and fifties. Back then it was like out of necessity or just tradition. They did that. Doesn't you don't, it, doesn't you don't have that. Piss you off when you watch the movies and you see them like digging and it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, five minutes later, they've got a hole to. Oh, right. It's not that easy. Yeah. And my hours was not a full six foot, you know, and for casket, it was just for urns in a vessel but it had to be three feet deep by three feet by three feet and yeah. that's pretty significant you know especially yeah. when you're digging into hard clay you know you break through that clay uh layer and then once you get down uh, below that it's it's good so yes i had that happen that's why i was out in the way and and uh ended up going to florida and getting a tan and now i'm losing it again but that's okay it's part of it. while you guys are burning up uh we are quite cool it was 51 degrees here this morning um, I'm sure you guys would take that that natural uh, air conditioning right now, wouldn't it's you, Keith? Getting close to 100, and by close, I mean within a couple degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you, which is what yet else? another reason why hmm? no one should be moving to Nashville. <laughs> right. Yeah. Power outage. Everything, man. Right. Yeah. I mean, I heard that there were some power outages there. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're they're yeah, rolling that was in a specific area of town. Well, I don't think it was a. I don't know. It wasn't a rolling black. I mean, all I know is I heard them say, "Would you mind reducing your, or bringing the thermostat up a little higher so that they won't yeah. be running so hard?" And it's I, I'm like, on a oh, different. God. I'm on a different uh, power. <laughs> Which, uh, by the way, and I'm going to give company. him some love here. Our good friend KP Ken Kenny Brooklyn Ken. Um, who occasionally listens to our podcast. I don't know if he does anymore, but I'll, I'll let him know. I've, I've mentioned him, but he made a comment. Um, so what happens when you can't charge your EV? You tell us to turn our ACs down. We can't charge our EVs. What are we doing? So valid point. I get it. You use the F-150. But we'll get it <laughs> yeah, there. not the lightning version yeah. though, the, the the ice version. Right. But um, anyway, let's let's kind of get into some things that we were, we, we've, you know, I, I brought to the table today. Um, first of all, um, we have, um, you know, Keith and I like to talk music. We, we talk music from time to time. And, and there was a a recent album that, that came out, um, by I'm a big fan of these guys. I always have been, I've been following them since day one, um, Def Leppard. Um, they've been around for about 45 years now. First time I saw him was in 1978, and that was on the High and Dry tour, I believe it was. Yeah, that was 78 or 79. That was pre Mutt Mutt Lang, if I'm not mistaken. Um, actually, I think that was Mutt's first. Okay. First one. Well, here Um, now. And then he, and then he completely, completely changed gears with Pyromania, 
that came out in 1983, I believe it was, 82 or either 83. I think it was 83. Um, I saw them on the that High and Dry tour. Uh, they were touring with ACDC. And then I saw them on, they were headlining on the uh, Pyromania tour. And then, of course, in 80, 1984, it was New Year's Eve, 84, the 85, the drummer was unfortunately back home in England and was driving his Corvette, and um, he lost his his arm. And so they had to take a bit of a hiatus. Uh, then I saw them again, and this is the last time I saw them, was in 1986 at the Monsters of Rock Festival in Donington Park in England. Um, they were not a headliner. Ozzy Osbourne was the headliner, and the Scorpions were on that bill, as were uh, Motorhead, Warlock, a um, couple of others. I forget, you know, who they were, but um, Def Leppard was there, and they were awesome. It was the first time Rick Allen uh, played the drums since losing his arm, and they played a few tracks off of um, their new upcoming album called Hysteria that yeah. came out a year later, which was a pretty amazing um album as well sales wise for them i know a lot of people lost interest in in def leppard because of their what we call cookie cutter sound but well that was if anybody mutt if lang. anybody knows mutt lang yeah. it's going to be keith because keith is the the engineer of the two of us here sound engineer but um mutt oh, lang yeah, I, gotta, is, I just thought of this i have a weird i have a weird connection to him do you really yeah like I just didn't. You just you just reminded me. So, okay. um, I I went through. Uh, I'm gonna make this really fast, but I graduated from a. Uh, I mean, it's huge at the time. It wasn't as big, but uh, it was a music industry school. They had mm-hmm. Sony. I think paid for a lot of the production studios that we. They were nice. Yeah, like full on high end engineering boards, equipment. We had digital um, we had digital technology back then. But this was before you could go buy an iMac and um, mm-hmm. and and when you know, pro, basically pro tools course, were. Yeah, yeah pro tools were basically. Bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. was. Yeah. We had pro tools rigs and it yeah. took up the whole studio. OK, absolutely. So um, at that time, I was in that that school at, at in college Right. Um, a friend of mine who was also in the music school, who was a drummer, it was my one of my roommates, um, had a, another friend in the program, mm-hmm. and that guy was an engineer, or he had just graduated, and he was Shania Twain's road, I think he was her studio and her road engineer. Oh. And I'm not going to name names because uh, of, like, things that I he told me that I might let slip, but um, I, I learned... To what extent her pitch was managed, yeah, and w- what kind of equipment it took to get her to sing in key and all that stuff, right? And right. but that, but you have to remember. So what? So how does this tie into Mutt Lang? Well, of course, well they were married at the time, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean Mutt Lang changed the Mutt Lang produced some great acts such as mm-hmm. Def Leppard, ACDC, uh, Shania Twain. Um, I mean he he basically. You know, you can say what you want to say. I mean, he he develops the sound and sticks with that formula for just about every every artist that he is working with. If it works and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, and this is sort of a conversation that you and I have um, you, anecdotally, but but honestly, there's a lot of truth in this all the time, which is, you know, at, at what point do you draw the line between creating art and, you know, making a business? And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people throughout the years have said, well, don't ever sell out, right? Like you do it to create the art, no other reason. But if you if you can't pay the bills, mm-hmm. at some point you do have to compromise in there. And, you know, I, I right. think that's always been the challenge, right? Yeah, absolutely. It has. Um, I'm not real sure who the producer was on this latest album by these guys. Um, I, I brought it up, I think, um, uh, You're gonna make pro- me leave my Amazon shopping cart. No, to- <laughs> I got it. Um, producer is Ronan McHugh. Um, and again, Def Leppard's still on the bludgeon, Rafola and Mercury labels. They have, they've been with bludgeon, Rafola forever, man. Um, and so you really uh, like this album. I, I do for a lot of reasons, Keith. 
um, again, I mean, they'll never they'll you can't you can't make another high and dry. That was one of those lightning in a bottle. And you're right, that albums. was that was I think that was Mutt Lang's first. That and was he Mutt also Lang's produced first. ACDC. Highway to Hell. Right before that. So there's absolutely your there, right? Yeah, and that's why they were on tour together um, uh, because Mutt was producing both of them, and he suggested that they they go on tour with those guys and open up for them. And unfortunately, we lost Bon Scott that following year, and he didn't get to complete that tour. And then like a year later, man, they, they pull out b- Back in Black with um, Brian Johnson, and you think you can't replace Bon. Well, they didn't replace Bond. They just kind of moved on with Brian and created a whole other level of I, ACDC I kind of like that. You know, I mean... Um, I did, too. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, when you... when you Okay, when you look at the bands that have done that, and it mm-hmm. it, it tends to work more times than it doesn't, I, I think when you go the other direction, which is l- like... Like Journey, right? Like, let's find right. a guy that sounds just like Steve Perry. So when you close your eyes, you can't tell. I think you kind of have to with a band like that because and, that vocal is such a trademark to that band. Well, you know? but did you know, Jay? Well, now you now you've now there's a whole other can of worms. Right. Steve Perry was not the original vocalist with Journey. No, he right? wasn't. They, what was it like? Three albums they released before. Yeah, and it was it was good. But it was hard hard rocking too, man. Yeah. Well, that's well, that's. Yeah, it was. It had a little bit more of kind of a uh, soul mm-hmm. kind of, but that's that's where they they found their you know their wheelhouse was with Steve Perry. Well, it was well, but, Steve but Perry then, was a great writer as well. But so. then you have the departure of David Lee Roth and Van Halen, and they didn't go. Let's go find a guy that sounds just like Dave. No, they said they, let's go get somebody better. Right? They, they were. <laughs> Okay, that's a whole other argument, right? <laughs> but they they were going for let's you know we're an arena band. Let's go grab a guy that can that can handle the arena audience. And and I honestly I don't think you could have chosen a better uh, vocalist from that point on because Sammy Hager really did <laughs> catapult those guys to commercial success. Now we've had this argument, and you guys can go back to our where we 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 talk about it, Dave or Sammy. It's on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Parks County Gurus. Make sure if you're over there. Hit that subscribe button. Turn it from red to gray. That way, we can get some love. Um, we we keep growing, and we thank you for that. And that's that's all because of, of you guys subscribing to our channel. So thanks for that. Um, but so I think that Diamond Star I, Halos, Diamond right? Star Halos. Uh, I I listened to it from start to finish, and I had it in isolation um, with my with my new AirPods Pros. And we'll get into the that other don't, that don't work. Oh, so this is why you the, like the album because you just listen to it in mono, right? Yeah. <laughs> the pros. No, I, I listen to it with the pros. Okay, but I can't listen to it with my regular AirPod third generation because the left earbud does not want to yeah. connect. So, and that's a conversation we're going to have in a minute. Well, but I I like it, and here's why I like it. because you've got Phil Collin that is still that he's a great guitar player, man, a great guitar player. He is a great, he has a great stage presence. They, their live shows are really good still to this day. Um, Vivian Campbell on guitar who came in and, and, and replaced Stephen Clark after Steve passed away. I loved Vivian because Vivian used to be with Dio. He was part of Ronnie James Dio's band, the original band. Um, I mean, he had uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny Apice and I think, um, oh gosh, I forget the bass player's name, but anyway, great band, but they, they went on now they have formed a tribute band called last in line, which is a tribute band to Dio. And they have a singer that, that sounds like Ronnie James to some degree, uh, sounds good, but Joe, you can tell Joe Elliott, lead vocalist, you can tell that he has met his limit on the octaves that he can hit. Oh, yeah. And he doesn't overshoot his strength. You you get what I'm saying? And I could feel that in the album, and I appreciate that. And here's why I appreciate that, because I, if I'm going to go see them, I don't expect them to hit that super high note. And and why I'm saying this is because you got these guys that are still out there professionally doing this crap, and you got Vince Neal from Motley Crue that's been sitting there in Nashville eating Nashville hot chicken, putting on about 500 pounds, and can't hit a note for nothing. Hey, Vince, listen to me. Put the chicken down <laughs> and go get in shape and go on tour because – 
Def Leppard is going to blow you guys off the stage. Anyway, that's my that's my so yeah. Soapbox. Well, and so if you guys have uh, a, an Apple Music subscription, or even if you don't and you want one, we'll we'll mm-hmm. put a link to this in the mention on the podcast page. It's uh, yeah. Just go to yeah. our uh, website partscounterguru.com dot com and uh, click right. on the mention on the podcast link, and it'll be a what is this going to be episode one twenty five? I think one twenty five or something like that. Yeah, and and uh, you know again, even though Mutt Lang did not produce this they still hung up hung on to well, some a, of his it's a very different sound and that in it itself is. doesn't bother me i mm. i think i it I, you know so i went and got it in, independently of us like i this is the first time i've talked to you about this was right here on yeah. this very mm-hmm. program and um i was not as but this is art, man. I mean, some people, you know, everybody has their own style that they prefer. It yeah, you like, me I mean, like you like, you. yeah, because I mean, you like Sammy Hager. And I mean, we all know that there's no <laughs> better lead vocalist than David Lee Ross. So, yeah, I mean, come on, Unchained, really? I mean, yeah, just a great album. But anyway, um, no, y- y- uh, you're right. Um, it's different. It's It's not. But what I did is when I, I know who they are big fans of. They are big fans of, and they'll tell you this, uh, T-Rex, um, David Bowie, those artists. And in fact, this the title comes from the single put out by T-Rex, um, Get It On. And that is a lyric in that song called Diamond Star Halos. Have you seen the trailer for the new Bowie movie? I have not. I have not. It just watch it. It's, okay. I, well, I yeah. can't wait for. I've been. It's all been waiting his music, for it. right? Mm-hmm. It's good. It's, yeah. yeah. It's. It, I, yeah. I. I. I am. I have Bowie work in my album in my collection. I have some mm-hmm. of his albums. Um, it, he's one of those that you have to. You know, mm-hmm. even if you're not, you know, an Ella Fitzgerald fan, you you have listened to her music, even mm-hmm. if you're not a Duke Ellington fan, you are familiar with his work. You know, even if you're not a, give me some huge pop icon, like, you know, I don't know what, Phil Collins. Peter, Phil Collins, yeah, yeah. You you know his work, right? Yeah, you may not care absolutely. for his style, but you, you're familiar with why he was relevant. Yeah, right? Sting. Sting, Sting, yeah. Sting's an yeah. acquired taste, right? Like, he's, mm-hmm. um, he's very talented, but he's not for everyone. Uh, right. He, he tends to lean, lean heavily towards the jazz Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, genre and some people yeah. just aren't but you're familiar with his work and Bowie's no different yeah. like even yeah. if you're not a huge fan of the music you've, you, you're you familiar with his work oh yeah so that was me going into this and then you know when, when I saw how this movie looks like it's going to be produced and put mm-hmm. together I'm fascinated okay I can't wait yeah I'm, 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 I'm more into uh, I call them rockumentaries yeah uh, than I am anything else just because of the truth in most situations in the history behind it, I'd like to learn more about you right. know, some of my idols right. and Dave, uh, David Bowie was definitely one of, one of my favorites back in the day. But I, I will tell you this, that this album, Di- um, Diamond Star Halos, when I'm listening to it, I hear some, uh, some, a little bit of Duran Duran in there. I hear a little bit of U2. I hear a little bit of Zeppelin um, and some T-Rex. Yeah. And so, I felt like I got more of their influences. Um, I felt more of their influences in this album than any other album I've ever felt before because they've, they kind of carve their way with their sound up through um, pyromania. And then of course, hysteria comes out. They had to change a lot of things because of the drummer um, surely had some limitations, but now he has found his way with his electronic kit and he seems to get around on that thing. Just no problem. I, you could never tell me that they had a, a, a drummer with one arm. I mean, it just sounds yeah. flawless to me. And that's, you know, he's come a long way with building his kits, their custom kits, right? Uh, you know, for him specifically. And instead of using an arm, he's using a foot uh, in place of the arm and it works just perfectly. And again, I've seen him live uh, without, uh, with him with when he first came back um, just prior to the release of Hysteria, and they were great. So rock on, guys. I love you. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan. So, you know, high and dry, baby. Keep it, keep it rolling. So anyway, so um, 
you know, I, I mentioned in the intro, I had a little AirPod issue. I got a really, really bad problem with the AirPod issue. So I bought my first pair I'm of sorry, AirPod. Air, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, wait a minute. My left ear. Yeah. So I bought third generation, just AirPods, not the pros. Um, and the, the main reason why I got it is because they would work with my Apple TV plus or my Apple TV box yeah. so that I could, I could sync them and through Bluetooth and, and watch shows with the volume up and not, not, not bother anyone next door or my wife when she's still sleeping. Cause right. I get up pretty early and love them. Loved them. I, I, I had them for about a month and then all of a sudden the left ear, uh, earbud would not connect and I went through the whole resetting process that Apple takes you through several times and then I took it to each device to see if it would connect and it still would never pick up so I finally called Apple support and got it sent in and um, which is a real quick process I love the process how it works they send you a box you send the box back it's all prepaid tracking number you can watch the order progress the the, uh, maintenance progress and everything and um, that happened I followed it and then they send it back, and, and it has a new serial number. So I thought I got a whole new set, but it, it didn't. They just basically replaced the charger. Now, so wait like, a second. Okay. Where is the serial number? Uh, the serial number. Good question. Is it on uh, the well, case? It, it's, or the- it's on the case. It is on the case. You have to lift the lid on the inside. You'll okay. find it. Uh, or it is on the box that you purchased it. But because they swapped the case on me, it was not the original case that matched my original box of purchase. So now I had to record that. That's a good question, Keith. Thank you for bringing that up. But now in the app, can you see that the serial number of the pods are still the same? Or uh, how, do you, how do you know? How did yes. you know they were the same ones that they sent? Right. Back? So whenever whenever I um, got ready to send them back, I wanted to do my due diligence on my end and be prepared when I was talking to the technician um, or the representative. They were not technicians, but representative. I had my serial number written down because I took it right off the box and I had learned where, where do you get the serial number from? And they said, lift the lid. You can see it. It's on the inside. Okay. You have to magnify it, by the way. You won't be able to see it with, yeah, right. They're tiny. with the I've naked eye. They're tiny. Right. right. But um, so I did that. So I wrote down all of my information before talking to them and then had it ready. But also when you register it on your, your device devices, it registers, it knows what the serial number is. So based on the charger, not the earbuds themselves, but the charger. It goes off the charger because that is the main unit. Um, so that um, was recorded on my phone, and I noticed when it was coming back, when I opened it up, it went to pair. It was a completely different serial number. Okay? So I called them, and I asked them, I said, did I get a whole new pair, or what happened here? And they said, no, they replaced the charger. I'm like, okay, perfect. All right. Which, you say charger, you mean case. The case, yeah. yeah. And so I battery uh, in that case and it charges. Yeah. Yeah. Which by the way is incredible how long a a charge it holds and how often you can reuse it. And I'm following all the instructions on this to keep those batteries, uh, you know, very, very healthy. But, um, so I, um, get them back and lo and behold, two days later in the middle of a business call, uh, the left ear drops out again. And I'm like, what's going on? So I try to go through all the motions where you have to disconnect and repair it just as Apple describes, which by the way, we'll leave a, we'll leave a link to that process that you have to go through. I read um, through it. It's like, you know, restart your device, update your software. That's it. This is the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, in days past would be the equivalent of, you know, reboot your computer. Like, or, you know, right. check, yeah. check to make sure you're not an idiot first. Right. right. And then, and then it gets into like, you know, you hold, you disconnect and then you unpair them and then you hold down this button for like 20 seconds right. and then you, you resets everything and then you can. Right. And then you open it, you open it next to your phone or your device, specifically your phone. And it, it, the interface pops right up and it tells you you're, you're paired. And then it tells you the charging status of the, of the um, case, um, as well as the charging status of the two um, earbuds as well. Each one has its own charging status. What would happen was, is that it would, when you would pull them out of the, the, um, uh, case, the right one would always show a charge. And then all of a sudden the charge would disappear on the left. Like it was, there was no, no Bluetooth connectivity. And sure enough, it would never, Wonder it would if just that never connect. A bad battery. Well, that's, that's what I, it's what I keep trying to tell the guys. Yeah. So I call them back after it dropped out again. They're, they're all apologetic and everything, and they go through the whole process again. I mail it to them, and then they've got it for like 
maybe two or three hours and I see they've already generated another one. And, and I, I, I look at the status and it says could not reproduce problem or duplicate problem. So I got on the phone and I said, don't let the box leave. I'm telling you this, there's still more to this man. And, um, the lady told me, she says, there's nothing I can do about it. It's already shipping to you. So here's what you're going to have to do. Um, if it happens again, you're going to have to turn right around and bring it back. And I said, you know what? I'm traveling. Here's what I'm going to do. If this does happen to me again, which I'm certain it will, I will take care of myself. I'm just going to go out and buy a brand new pair. And then you guys can either refund my money on these or give me another set. I'll take them. I don't, I don't care, but just give me another set or, or refund my money. And lo and behold, in the middle of the airport, the left one dropped out again as I'm waiting for my flight. And luckily, I was near a store in the Seattle airport uh, where I could go buy a brand new set. And they had Air, uh, AirPod Pros. And I said, screw it. I'm just going to spend the extra money. And I bought the AirPod Pros. And guess what? Those AirPod Pros work fantastic. They've never... They've never given me a lick of problem, and I love them. So why wouldn't you just, like, demand that they replace the ones that you have? I mean, you've sent them back I several have. times. Uh, I have. One would think that at, you, you've gone through the motion, so to speak, in terms of playing by their rules at some point. Right. Don't they have to? I have I have pleaded with them on, on each occasion mm -hmm. to make sure you put a note in there that r at least replace the one earbud or both the earbuds this time. Um, also, I said, please put a note in here. Do not ask me again about going to a retail location because that is not an option for me. It's an, it's an hour to two hour drive in either direction. So let's do this this way. I, I'm wondering now though, if I, if it isn't worth the drive down to a store just to say, Hey, I, I've, I've sent these back like three times and they're still not working. So anyway, I'm going to be getting these back. I just got the notification like two hours ago, by the way. So here's an update for you. Third time that I've sent them in and they're on their way back. And it just said repaired problem. There are no specifics. Yeah. We shall see what happens. My expectation of this is, and I told them to make sure they put it in the notes, that the left AirPod is no good. It's no good. Right. So replace them. So maybe they replace them this time. We shall see. Stay tuned for an updated um, uh, situation. I'm holding my, my breath over Are here. you holding your yeah. breath? Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, I'll just put them online here, and I'll just take the, the highest bidder. Well, I mean, you can't even you do can that if, they're, if it's broken. No. I mean, well, maybe someone needs a charging case, or maybe someone needs uh, a, a, a right yeah. earpod. You know, that's true. That'd be worth something because they're not doing me any good, man. Anyway, that's my plight, my AirPod uh, dilemma, and um, I would highly recommend to anyone just completely go past AirPod third generation and go right to AirPod Pro. Yeah, Sideshot has the pros, and he loves them, and they are they're cool. I've, yeah, uh, they're they're they're, yeah. they're pretty darn amazing. Pretty, pretty darn amazing. So, hey, do you want to um, tell uh, people about the uh, the item that we have that they can purchase um, by chance, Keith? Do you know what that is? We sell an AirPods. What are you talking about? On our website? What? Yeah, the uh, Roto Wipe. Oh, no, that's all you, buddy. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so, well, you know, we just wanted to let you guys know that there are some gifts out there that you could you could really, really give someone. You know, Roto Wipe. Uh, Roto Wipe is a personal cleansing wheel. Uh, with a soft touch, and just basically say goodbye to costly toilet paper. Um, Roto Wipe is a um, uh, basically a powered wheel that um, fits to your toilet seat. And as you sit down, instead of using toilet paper, it cleans your bum to like no other cleaning experience you've ever had. It hands down beats the uh, bidet with so the water this is like those car washes that have the spinning brushes right uh pretty much um it, that, that, it, there's a stripping disc um <laughs> uh eight <laughs> has 846 uh, nylon pylon bristles that makes quick work of vegetables fruit and smaller pointed knick knickknacks um you can use it for that as well uh, it has multi-purposes um, you know, we'll, we'll put a link up on our, on our website for you guys, if you want to buy this, but you know, Roto wipe is that, you know, you think of dad, 
you know, dad, dad may want these. Maybe post Father's Day, you forgot to get dad something for Father's Day. You know, maybe you want to get this for dad. Make his make his butt feel a little bit better. So that's Roto Wipe. Um, it's it's a wheel, uh, a, a wheel. It's for fresh, clean buttocks. Um, it is a personal cleansing wheel with a soft touch. So don't forget that for dad, guys. So just reading the reviews on Amazon, uh, mm -hmm. may I? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead. A few years back, my wife purchased a French-style bidet. While it provided a marked improvement from TP, it never quite had the power to cut through the really tough messes. <laughs> Being a man of large stature and beastly disposition... <laughs> I never felt like I was able to achieve a sufficient level of cleanliness. After some forceful compl complaints from my wife, I decided to try the Roto Wipe. Since finding the Roto Wipe, my wife and I have never been happier. Uh, it has the power to cut through my toughest of messes. It is highly Oof. stimulated and delivers a cleanliness you can feel. <laughs> Ooh, I bet, man. Based on the, the size of that brush... And the number of bristles it has on it, I'm sure every rotation is just an absolute joy. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Just again, look for that on the mentioned on the podcast. Uh, yeah. Mention on the podcast, guys. It's just something, you know, something for you guys to take home to dad, you know, just anyway. So let's get into some of our, some of our hot topics of the day, man. Boy, do we have them, don't we? Sure. Yes. And yes. Go, and, and let's, well, your turn, pal. I've been talking too much today. You're um, on. <clears throat> so, we got a lot of Ford stuff here. Um, they they drew the short straw. I told you. And uh, let's start with something on a lighter note. Um, okay. So this uh, is a real. This is real. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you don't if you don't believe me, um, we uh, can put the link to the actual um, part number. I get. Do we have the part number, Jay? Well, here, let Ford. me tell everybody what it is. And what it is, yeah. So Ford is um, basically trolling Tesla owners mm -hmm. yep. by offering an adapter to charge your Tesla that comes mm -hmm. with uh, or as an, an optional accessory for the F-150 Lightning. Now, that's Ford's electric, all-electric truck. Right. For those of you that don't know, most of your EVs now either come with multiple charging adapters or they give you the option to buy them for an extra charge. And no pun intended there, but the reason um, being, you know, Tesla, the superchargers, as they call them, has their own kind of connector. Right. Um, and then various uh, different manufacturers of these charge stations also offer different types of plugs. Think about it like this, like... Uh, you know, almost like different countries, there's no standard, right? Like you travel to the European Union, you have to have that weird adapter for all your like plug-in stuff. It's right. the same here. And that has to do with manufacturers deciding different ways to basically deliver that charge current safely so that you don't kill yourself because it's high voltage when you, you know, you're going through that cable. So I digress. Ford <laughs> now has the ability to charge teslas straight off the f-150 lightning yeah through adapters exactly right and yeah you were asking about parts not part numbers they supply you with the brand as a lens l-e-n-z j1772 um so it's also aftermarket. it's aftermarket okay. um it basically says it is um compatible with all tesla vehicles um before put together their own uh little instruction uh pamphlet that comes with this kit um, so you get the 30 amp connector supplied with the vehicle. Uh, you get a coupler and control box, which is supplied with the vehicle, but then they supply you with the adapter. Um, it's an L1430P to 1450 uh, R. So that, that converts it from the standard charging to the, is that right? High, uh, the high, high fast charge. Right. Is that what it's, yeah, that's what yeah, it's yeah. for? Uh, so you have to have that in, uh, for the Ford adapter in order to make it work with the lens adapter that plugs into the Tesla itself. So that's a convert that comes with the kit. Now you can and, buy all this stuff separately, but this is a kit that Ford provides. Yeah, and there is an option of that F 
150 Lightning that comes with an onboard generator. It's their pro power that you, That's right. you can... Uh, Remember the guy in Texas yeah, when right. they had the huge power outage, the grid went down, well, guy powered was, his whole house. That was the Lightning, though. That was the... No, uh, it, was, it wasn't Lightning. It was an F-150 hybrid Yeah. Um, that has this this package on it. The, the hybrids have this package. The Power Boost hybrid can provide 20 miles, they say, of range in a Mach-E for every hour of charging or 13 miles in another F-150 Lightning. Um, they say they guess that the 240 volt outlet will provide a similar amount of range to any Tesla. Ford says that the onboard generator can fully power a home for up to three days. Wow. Yeah, I was. Eh, eh, no, it's, you're not going to run the air conditioning for three days off that thing. Well, no, but if you're no, you're not. If you're if you're in a situation where it's um, lighting, yes, refrigerator, lighting, yes. refrigeration, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yet, yeah. so it's it's mild usage, right? Uh, to get you the basics that you need, you know, maybe a fan um, to kind of keep you cool. But yeah, air conditions draw a lot of a lot of power. So yeah, definitely uh, probably not not that. But yeah, it's kind of interesting, you know. What the heck? It's there's usages that people wouldn't normally um, think that they could use them for, but there are two right there. Uh, I think the whole intent on this thing, the uh, generator setup on this thing was to help um, small fleets, you know, maybe construction site workers or whatever, have have the ability to be able to power things up as they need as well. Or campers, camping. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. For sure, yeah. man. So um, there you go. So from here, it's kind of a down, downhill slide for Ford. And <laughs> and by that, I mean, uh, that's the good news, everybody. Now for the bad news and mm. um we have said before on this program that we admire frequently how ford chooses to handle some of this bad news mm -hmm. this is going to be an interesting time to watch uh because we are in a little bit different times i think than we even were a year year and a half ago when some of these previous issues cropped up uh, sales are are down. Supply chain is an issue, and we've got this whole I, you know possible economic crash looming because you know the Fed keeps raising interest rates, and I you know Amazon's not hitting their um, sales numbers. They're down. It's looking iffy. So we've got a Maki -E situation just to kind of transition this over to another Ford vehicle, but also on the electrification side. Right. And I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I think you know what I'm doing. Absolutely. Um, so we got a couple Mach-E recalls. All right. Now, if you're not familiar with the Mach-E, that's Ford's electric crossover. They call it a Mustang Mach-E. I'm not, you know, for those of you that say it's not a real Mustang. Yeah, we know. Go, go look at our, we actually reviewed this, drove it, took it for a test drive. Jay drove it. We've got that video out on YouTube. You can find it just, Part, uh, youtube.com forward slash parts counter gurus make sure you're subscribed while you're there give it a watch see what you think yeah so um this first one was forty eight thousand mustangs and um this is kind of humorous um <laughs> <laughs> you're right a safety what, what, defect well, yeah. could potentially render the vehicle immobile it could immobilize the car and the reason is um there's a malfunction that involves overheating of the battery high voltage con contactors. Jay? Contact the contacts, yeah, yeah. It, it's the connection, yeah. and it's a connection. Yeah. You have to heat is an issue with any battery operated vehicle, both in charging and in uh, just the utilization well, driving, because heat, you're heat is an issue. Current, heat right? is an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Heat is an issue regarding electrical components, anyway. When you're, when you're dealing with that, remember the original when they went to electronic ignition and Ford had the firewall mounted, what we call brain boxes, computers. Yeah. And they had the cannon plugs that you plugged in. And if you if you looked at the back side of those things, and this is primitive stuff, this is back in the, the, the mid late 70s. Um, it was just the circuitry inside the control module was covered in this silicon. It was exposed otherwise, so it overheated a lot. And I can remember my dad keeping a jug of water in the trunk for when that car, over, that module would overheat. We'd be stranded on the side of the road. He'd pour water on the outside of the metal casing just to cool it down. Yeah. Ten minutes later, fire right up. 
This is the same kind of situation. It's similar, yeah. but in a more modern well, type you know, of a situation. Anytime, I mean, this is, to a lesser extent, this is the same reason that, like, for example, the, some of these Teslas that have launch mode, if you're trying to do a quarter mile in them, right. it takes about five, ten minutes of the car prepping itself before you are allowed to launch that vehicle. And when you're pushing a lot of current to those motors very quickly, those wires get hot. All those connected components get very, very hot. And so there's some sort of a heat sensor in here, and it's shutting the car down. Um, 48,924 Mustang Mach-E vehicles uh, are expected to potentially be affected by the problem. So that's right. like half the vehicles produced. What was the range? Uh, uh, they had a hundred. They built a hundred thousand of them, by the way. Yeah, I okay. think it's about yeah. So yeah, so and those hundred thousand were built between May 2021 and. May twenty fourth uh, of twenty two. Yeah. yeah. So no, actually, go. wait a minute. They say uh, the affected the affected vehicles include model year twenty twenty one and twenty two, but they were built between May twenty seventh twenty twenty and May twenty fourth twenty twenty two. That's production years, uh, but years twenty one and twenty two are affected. Yes. So and this was at thinking, the Co Codland plant in Mexico. I think is where they were assembled. Okay. Um, possibly a repair happening over the air, which is great. Correct. Mm -hmm. um that'll be interesting though first generation problems well i mean they're just going to reduce the amount of well that's what i was about to say so allowed. so as a maki -E owner yeah i'm now worried am i going to get the full you know what i was promised when i bought this car because now is it well, going to is the propulsion going to be like it was before you potentially go out and you put this thing in performance mode and you drive it hard. And mm -hmm. if you're, you know, whether you're not supposed to be racing or you are, or you're off, you know, city streets or whatever, you potentially could have the car's software override your, your wishes so that it doesn't shut itself down or catch fire. Right. So, Correct. So yeah. I'm a little peeved about that. If I'm an owner, this is something that should have been thought of before in testing. And again, you think a retrofit would be, uh, I do. I think. Uh, I think. I think they need to address it in that way. And maybe this is, maybe this is the first step in the campaign to remedy the issue. But like I said, I think if it's a software update, then you're still dealing with the same hardware that you already have um, on board and software. They're just basically pushing a piece of software to function in a different manner that would not allow the maximum amount of, of voltage through across right. that connection. And again. If I'm an owner of one of these, I, I, I would be light bulbs would be going off going, OK, I'm going to make sure the performance of this thing is still what it's supposed to be. Well, and I would be looking at range as well. And if you're a potential owner, meaning you haven't yet taken delivery, uh, mm -hmm. this is getting even more interesting because Ford has halted sales. So you can actually still buy the vehicle on paper. You just can't take delivery of it was my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, they are not going to give you the keys to this vehicle until they have a fix in place for it, which is the right thing to do. So again, as bad as it sounds, Ford does kind of handle their business like they should um, in this particular instance. But I hope that they are, are transparent with their customers, the owners of these vehicles, to give them the list of things to look for for feedback for Ford because they're going to need that. And, and if I'm an owner, I'm going to be looking at my charging rate. How quickly does it charge now? How quickly does it discharge now? Did my range go down? How much power do I have? Can I hit zero to 60 in the four seconds that they said I could? Right. Test those things, guys. I mean, I'm not telling you to get on the highway and act like an idiot, but I am just telling you that you have a right as a consumer, as an owner of one of these vehicles, to make sure that they are delivering on what they said that you uh, bought initially. Otherwise, this could be a stinky deal for them. Looks like uh, potentially the fix comes in the third quarter of 22. So in the window of July to September is what Ford yeah. is projecting. It's an entire quarter that they're projecting yeah. the fix could could drop. You could be 40, waiting a bit if you don't have it yet. 49,000 Mustang Mach-E's. Ooh, that's a, that's a ka-ching. Yeah. Ka-ching. That's, so, that's a significant, yeah. That's half, yeah, so keep, half the production. So, Hey, okay, so all you Mustang mach -E's, uh owners, make sure you stay tuned to our channel at uh, Parts Kind of Guru um, or YouTube.com forward slash Parts Kind of Gurus, and we'll we'll uh, we'll keep you up to date on that. We'll we'll bring some updates up if I can find the actual recall and or the um, 
the fix to this, um, I will provide a link for that on the mentioned on the podcast section of this, which is over at parkscountyguru.com. So there you go. Mm. Wow, dude. Uh, and, you know, we we love Ford. Um, well, no one is immune to these issues, right? So no. there's we've already reported on issues from GM. Tesla's had their share of issues. Um, yeah. You know, Rivian has had some as well, although it wasn't it wasn't a shutdown, so to speak. They had some hood, they had some uh, body assembly issues. I mean, any of this first generation EV, it, it is a brand new platform, and mm-hmm. I, I don't whether it's electric or gas or just internal combustion. N- no first generation platform that I in recent years has gone without issue of some sort. That mm-hmm. almost comes with the territory of buying into a first generation platform, right? Right, right. Uh, okay, Bronco has had their share. I mean, that's well, you know. So, well, let's get into the Ford Bronco uh, issues that 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 are ensuing right now. And the funny thing about this, ladies and gentlemen, Ford is is not. They they are not performing well in the in the department of hey we're putting out the the quality blue oval product that that you're used to stuff. They got some problems. They got some shortcomings right now. And let's just hope they handle it well. Funny thing is, Keith, is that our good friend Malia, over at the tavern, mm-hmm. approached me just the other day and asked me what I thought about the Ford Bronco. She looking at she, one. She 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 wants to buy one and she loves the cactus gray and I and she wants the four door. I said, cool, that suits you. She's telling me about why she likes it. I said, those are good reasons. Those are good reasons. I said, do you have a preference on engine? And she goes, well, everybody's telling me that I should get the bigger one. I said, well, if I'm you, uh, yeah, I would wait if you want the bigger one. Uh, because uh, apparently Ford has a, a has a little bit of a problem with that 2.7 liter EcoBoost. So she's going to wait. I I advised her on, you know, let's see how this pans out, and I will keep her up to speed on what's going on. So let's talk about this problem that Ford has, Keith, and um, with the Bronco. The Bronco not only kind of trickled out. uh, Matter of fact, there's still uh, order uh, reservation holders that still have not gotten their their Broncos. Is that correct, Keith? There's still people waiting. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's um, first... Nah, they don't call it first edition. Do they call it? Yeah, they did call it first yeah, edition. Yeah, first edition, that yeah. Are still being delivered. Um, so I did a review of an Edge earlier this year, and I took a little bit of heat on this from the viewers because, and and this is my personal belief, and I, I don't know how you feel about this, Jay, and we might have differing opinions on this based on what you told Malia, but, um, I, you know, I wanted the bigger engine, and I've, I personally feel like for a while Ford has been utilizing their smaller engines and running them harder Mm -hmm. and, and they're holding up and they've done fairly well. But to me, that engine has to work harder than the larger equivalent. And sometimes Mm -hmm. you can even make the argument that the bigger engine is more fuel efficient because it's not working as hard. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have typically been a fan of, you know, give me a bigger engine that I don't have to run up in the higher, you know, at 85% of its capabilities Sure. because, you know, the old saying, I guess, you know, the hot, the hot, the, the hotter they, they fly, the faster they fry. I mean, it's pretty much, um, it's about efficiency too. I mean, the, the hotter they get, the less efficient they become because of the space at heat you know, getting rid of the heat, the heat transfer, those sorts of things is what makes those vehicles, those engines efficient. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and they've done some really creative things to manage that and to compensate for, you know, sure. the heat that they direct were, injection. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of different things. Yes. Going but I'm on these just things. not, I'm just not, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm old school. I just am mm-hmm. not a fan of these smaller engines um trying to do the job in a big off-road vehicle let me here so i found jay i'll have to send you this um okay a honda civic ad from 1978 Ooh, classic now let me let me take you back to a time when we had leaded gasoline which we used to call regular right, right? remember that 
Yes, I do. Which, by okay. the way, I was in a ga- at a gas station in Florida, and there was an option not to buy not to buy leaded, but to buy pure unleaded without ethanol in it. That was it had its own separate little pump. Okay. Yeah, that I've seen is, that. Yeah. Yeah. And and so not here. You won't see we that. We had but. a we had a similar in the late seventies and early eighties. We had a similar situation that we now have with ethanol, like E ten E fifteen. Right. In that we had regular, which again was leaded. We called it regular back then. And then we had unleaded, and then we would have premium, and you know there were very and that kind of put a lot of people out. So Honda's marketing people basically produced this Civic and leveraged the fact that it would just run on whatever you put in the tank. Mm. Okay, it would. It didn't have a catalytic converter, so you could right. put regular, which is right. leaded again, in yeah. it. Okay, and this is this is okay. So yeah, where am I going with this? Right, huh? that's a smaller engine, but it was designed on a smaller vehicle. And in 1978, do you, you want to guess at this, or you just want me to tell you the highway uh, EPA estimated highway and city probably miles? Probably fifty. Probably fifty-two. It was, it was actually with the manual. It was thirty highway and twenty three city. Oh, geez, but that's... now, hang on, the Civic CVCC, which was their five speed. Yeah. Um. But so the twelve hundred was the two speed. Right. That's the one I just gave you. Is twenty three okay. and thirty. That's a little run around town car. Yeah, 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 yeah. The small, small one, right? Yeah. yeah. So the five speed, you're you're very close. Forty seven highway, yeah. thirty seven city. Yeah, I thought that back in those days they did have some some uh, vehicles that could get near the fifty mile uh, per gallon range. So we're thirty plus years on now, mm-hmm. forty, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. almost fifty, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And we're still not really. I, we've kind of reached the limits of how the MPG game, you know. Yeah, and the the problem you have with this game that we're playing called MPG is emissions and emission controls are the root of that cause. That is basically the effect of emission controls and all of those things. You have the EPA saying you, you got to get this amount of gas mileage out of right. it, but you got to have, you Fleet can only mileage. have this amount of, yeah. of emissions come out of it. And that's why you've seen all these changes from a larger engine to a smaller displacement where they have a little bit better control over that. Yeah. Um, the... The problem you run into with that is you you have materials that are used that have not quite been uh-huh. vetted, if you will. And so, unfortunately, the consumer becomes the guinea pig. And it seems like to me, since the late 70s, through our transition to all of these great emission standards, the California way, if you will, And let me just say this. I'm going to say this real quick, and I hope I never have to say it again. Proposal 65 or whatever the heck that is, that's a problem. And it's a problem in a number of ways that where, and I think eventually California will have the way and the rest of the United States will be on that same page. And look, the worst is yet to come, in my opinion, because of that. The heavy-duty industry is still going through growing pains with that same problem is where they have put exhaust gas recirculation mm-hmm. on these things. These engines are not designed, the old diesels are not designed to, to have to deal with that. They're meant to breathe. Now, you take a look at an old push rod motor from the 70s, like a Ford or a small mm-hmm. block Chevrolet or big block Chevrolet, whatever, or a Ford small block, big block, whatever. Look at the valve stem seals. There are no positive stem seals in there. They've got umbrellas. That's it. They're just there to kind of help keep the splash down and and concentrate the oil in a specific position. Whereas now those positive steels are actually metering the amount of oil that goes in and gases that go through the engine to help control the emissions in the engine. And, and if those seals are bad, your emission levels go up. A lot of things happen. Oil burns. It's just a train wreck from there. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong with these newer vehicles. And that's where the problem in lies. It's like a refrigerator. Let me just give you one more analogy. A refrigerator has one sole purpose to keep food cold and make a little ice occasionally, right? The old fashioned one where you had the top 
top yep. door, yep. and it had the oh, ice trays I, I, you put yeah, in. I like this. Yeah, I know. Okay, okay. you yeah. got ice trays. Yeah. You filled them. You filled them with water, and you put them in, and you had ice cubes like an hour later. I love this. Okay, today yeah. we have these automated through the yeah. door ice makers. You, you want to make a uh, 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 a latte, margarita, it's, margarita. Margarita. Yes. Oh, by the way, let's check and see what the weather's going to be like today. Yeah. You got all this stuff. So the more stuff you put on these things, the more it's going to break. And guess what? Those fridges cost way. Refrigerators are now what? Four oh, or five thousand. Yeah. Easy. Right. Yeah. They're easy. The, four yeah. or five grand for these things. So be careful what you ask for. Right. And that's the case. So thank you for rescuing me from <laughs> almost heading down a like confusing path for our viewers and listeners. Um, are you sure? <laughs> you, well, you knew where I was going with this. Yeah. You, you helped steer it back to make the point, which was, this is sometimes mandated at a federal level, at a government level. And they've many times in the past come back and said, um, hey, car manufacturing industry, the rules are changing and you've got five years. And if you don't, we're going to find you, figure it out. And right. they don't, you know, they don't have like David Copperfield on their payroll. So it's not like they can just sort of magically come up with a solution. Right. Although maybe that's the way to go coming forward. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So right. they have to basically make. I don't want to say they cut corners, but they have to make compromises, right? Yeah, and If absolutely. you're going to require that Jimmy Buffett margarita machine in the door, now you've got it's going to take the place of extra ice cube space or something, and it's no exception mm -hmm. here. You know, if you're going to force Ford to have fleet mileage and they've got to have these smaller engines that they've got to slam in these, in these Broncos, well, we're going to get into problems. And we're about to tell you that there's a pretty significant engine problem that's coming to surface with these Broncos. But... Uh, th and you guys, this is proof, if ever there was proof, that we are not in the tank for EVs, right? Like, so we no. are, we're out here kind of just being well, agnostic and presenting the facts. We get a lot of hate sometimes from the internal combustion people. We, over we our, do. Yeah. Of our, of our industry, we do. And I, first off, I'd like to give a, you know, a, a, a nod to our friend Dave over at AERA. Um, I will say this for any of you who are AERA members, and if you are not, this is what these guys do. They share uh, quality information about new and or old vehicles for the sake of that machine shop that has to work on these failures that are coming in. If, let's say, Ford farms them out and they're not doing them internally, there's going to be a machine shop that they contract that, that has to do the work on these things. But they are on top of the situation, and they provide a lot of information for the aftermarket and or consumers that are uh, owners of these things. So the bottom line is 20 Nearly 26,000 um, uh, Ford full-size Broncos with a 2.7-liter EcoBoost uh, in V6 in it. Um, the NHTSA uh, uh, is filing uh, for these complaints that have, have come their way in regards to the engine failures. And we're going to talk about both, both reasons. 25,538 Broncos Whew. potentially have catastrophic engine failure. Let me just right. give that to you guys again. 25,538. That's, That's right. a lot. We're not mm -hmm. talking about a bad fuel pump. We're not right. talking about a battery connector issue. We're talking about complete catastrophic engine. You're going to have to replace the whole engine. Right. Absolutely. And it happens. You can't and just I do look the top half, right? You're going to have to replace the whole thing. Yeah, because catastrophic failure, basically, if you tag a valve or a valve breaks or whatever, it goes through the block, and next thing you know, it's just boom, you're done. You know, it's, it's done. You're, you're completely destroying the whole engine. There will probably be some salvageable components there, and, and potentially um, maybe the head or the block. Uh, but a lot of times when you have a catastrophic failure like that, man, especially a turbocharged application. But Ford's not going to pay their mechanics to take these things apart and salvage parts. They're going to have them send the bad one. They're going to replace them. Drop in a replacement. They're going to yeah. drop in a replacement engine. Yeah. That's why I'll, That's why NHTSA is, is involved in this and they're filing. Um, they're under, Ford is under investigation right now is the way I understand it. Now, when this, the first recall or the first notion of this came about, you had vehicles that were failing anywhere from 900 miles, brand new, up to around, say, 9,000 miles. That's the range. Anywhere between, a, a, say, 1,000 and 10,000 miles, they were having engine failures. And Ford uh, basically said that, that, that they, were, they, they located the 
problem that they were utilizing cheaper suboptimal valves that were acquired from a new supplier that apparently okay. didn't properly validate the product. I'm so not we've sure done I'd this before that. too. This mm-hmm. is well, let's just go back to this one for a second. Right. You have supply chain issues, you have vendor A, supplier A, yep. you have supplier B. Mm-hmm. Supplier C. We mm-hmm. just covered this with RJ and Rivian and him having to call three or four different suppliers and going, hey, supplier A's given me twenty thousand. What can you guys get? Surely you guys can give me twenty to twenty five thousand. Right. When right. you get to the supplier D or C or D, there's a reason those are su- I'm quoting you here, Jay. Those are there's yeah. a reason those are supplier C and D and not right. A or B. Right. And when you get down to that level of supply chain. You better bring your 18 quality control department in and inspect that product, because um, I'll be I will get. You can be. I, who do you want to be? You can be <laughs> Hannibal Face. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but that's it, man. You know, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the case, man. I mean, the bottom line is is that when you're dealing with these sorts of situations, you're gonna get you're gonna get burned. Um, I've been in, like I said, I've been in the supply chain middle of it being the being the person sourcing the product and qualifying the product and i understand that whole process and how that works and i also understand and you think people ask you well don't you have quality control processes in place well sure we do they're there so does that thing absolutely How's they get missed <laughs> he has that left ear exactly but that's the case man so here's the thing i am not real sure that the valve was initially the problem anyway. I think that the valve could be a result of the other problem, uh, which the issues aren't exactly new uh, to Ford because they have the same problem on the three liter V6 EcoBoost, um, which basically is, I think it's a a different version. It's the same as the 2.7, it's just a different uh, bore, I think. Um, But they had uh, problems with the oil oil pan, basically the uh, pickup tube uh, would 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 draw air. It would it would not, and it's not it's not really cavitation. Cavitation and aeration are two different things. It's kind of like pseudo cavitation, if you will, where air is actually introduced in to it because the oil level drops below the pickup, so air comes in. What happens when that occurs? Well, you can seize components. A a valve sticking in a valve guide and a piston you know, or, or, or just it, it, it's back and forth and it ramps really hard based on the curve of the camshaft. And when that happens, the valve goes through these, what they call hard dynamics. And it's just pounding against the seat and slamming and slamming until the fillet blend area, if it flexes on you, it wants to pop the head off. When that first started occurring on these initial failures, nobody could tell me, was it the intake valve? Was it the exhaust valve? Um, and was what does the valve look like? Did the valve stem have scuffing on the stem where it was sticking inside the valve guide? Um, or was it more of an impact? What did the tip look like? What is, what is the dynamic going on? What does the valve look like? That valve will tell you all you need to know. We never got that revealed to us. I understand why it's Ford. It's their business, not ours. Their job is to fix the problem and make you happy, not to explain necessarily explain all of the occurrences, only other than that it is their fault. Um, but a, a oil uh, pan situation being too shallow like that, just like in the, th- uh, the 3.0 liter, having those issues could certainly cause the valve failure. But the other thing it can cause is um, you get, you'll get metal shavings from, from one running dry, if they're running freely without getting the right amount of lubrication on a man, then you've got microscopic metallic uh, pieces running through that engine and getting on those bearings and all that stuff. And it'll seize up. It'll sure. absolutely seize up, which ties back into what we were saying on these smaller engines being utilized in circumstances when they really shouldn't. It's too, it's too much for the engine, which can cause that type of failure as well. If it, goes unseen in an, and say, let's just call a Pinto a Pinto. If it goes unseen in a Pinto, um, it's probably not going to be a catastrophic failure right away because it doesn't go through what a Ford Bronco will well, go through, what it's designed it's to do. Probably not tilting that thing either, which also mm-hmm. affects fluid levels sitting in engine compartments see, and whatnot. See, that's, right? the, that's the other thing. What this vehicle is designed for, I don't understand why they went the way they went with that. They should have recognized that. Now, I get it because of clearance. They don't want to hit the pan 
but you there trust me the aftermarket the aftermarket's going to come up with something to fix the problem guaranteed man it'll be an aftermarket company that will say oh you should have done this we'll see you do you just take them dang old spark plugs out in that little hole you just put a little hole around there just like bobby just said this dock it'd go boom boom just like that <laughs> exactly man put boom how on the job man so okay I love it. Do you know, I could not find where Ford has done any official recalls on this yet. Is that true? Are you There's aware not of any? Really, I am not aware of any official recall. Um, as soon as the valve, they the reported valve failure started happening, all I could find was the trail of communication between right. dealerships uh, and, and Ford about it. There was no fix initiated or anything like that. They were just letting everyone know they were under, they were investigating the problem and that they would get back to you. But at this time, there was no recall. So normally, ladies and gentlemen, in these circumstances, we would give you a recall procedure. We'd give you a number. We'd give you something, okay? Mm -hmm. At this point, because Ford has not made an official recall and it's still under investigation, the best we can offer is Make sure you hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Subscribe to the podcast. This will come up again. I guarantee you this will come up again. Oh. Make sure you're tied into us. We'll give you an update. Yes, definitely. Um, wow. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. You know, talking about supply chains, um, our good friends over at GM figured out a way how to uh, get out of a little this. bit of a bind. I love it. I love it, man. Isn't it great? Well, necessity is the mother of invention, right? What What do we say? You and I love innovation, right? Yep. You either innovate or get out of the game. And GM for a while, uh, they've, they've been accused of following. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I, I would say they've done their share of innovation in the past five years. You know, you've got the mid engine Corvette, the Cadillac Lyric has entered production. They've got the Hummer EV. That's, I think also it's either, it just started production if I'm not mistaken. Um, so but, yeah. which by the way, let me add to that. I, I sent you a little snippet. Um, there's going to be a Chevy Blazer e EV, right? Which is which is also going to be on the same uh, Ultium platform as the Lyric. Yeah. And I said to you that GM is very smart to well, do it's this. It's already a station. It's already a crossover anyway. Like why right. not just go ahead and make it an EV? Right. But when you sell a Cadillac, the Cadillac Lyric, yeah. that Cadillac better be right. Because that is a that is a very You're a prestigious. Fan of this. You're a fan of this. You started in the high end first, and then you let it trickle down in to the yeah. Okay, yeah. You see where I'm going with that? Yeah. This is this is it, man. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, Anyway, Lincoln's done that too. You know, they have. You put those new engines that are expensive to manufacture in the Lincoln brand first, or the Cadillac mm -hmm. brand first, and yeah. then when they become a little bit less expensive to mass produce, then you put them in your yeah your consumer grade, it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so. Part shortage being what it is, mm -hmm. GM has said, all right, how do we solve this? And they worked with, I think it's HP, mm -hmm. to, now these are yep. these are 3D printers, printers, but this is not what like you and I yeah. have in our garage. It's a multi-jet fusion 3D printer, yeah. These are commercial grade, and this is kind of, you can make, literally make car parts or houses out of this stuff. $200,000 right? per model. Per, yep. per model, yep. Um. And they are using those to produce parts that they have not been able to source otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and this is out it going in the Tahoe, or as I like to call it, the Tahui. The, the 2022. 2022. Yep. Tahui. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. This is what specific part is it? I'm looking at it here. It's a. Um, it's basically a a uh, like a gasket for the for the back tailgate. Okay. You know, so when you shut it, it seals. You remember what we were talking about with the Rivian where it had that noise, the fluttering noise, and yep. they had the, the underpinning of the frunk? Un, un, yeah. It, right, this, is, right. this is one of those types of seals, but it's molded, and it has to, it has to go over the, the edge of the, uh, the metal part of the tailgate and then fit it, mold it, and seal it when it closes. So that's basically what it is. Um, so, there, so, just by com so why does this matter? Like, well... Typically, when you have anything that has a plastic or rubberized plastic in it, nowadays in automobiles, those are it's injection molded. So, mm -hmm. 
that's a process. So they have to create the molds, first of all. And if it's a new part and they haven't used it in previous model years, creating right. that mold can take weeks. Absolutely. And they have to try it and they have to test fit it and all that. And then they have to revise the mold and make another mold. And making the mold itself takes time. Mm -hmm. Then you literally inject hot plastic, like molten plastic, into these molds. Right. And then you let it cool and you they pop it out and that's your part, right? Right. And that, this is a... Yeah. This is a flexible, like a rubberized it's kind of, some, it's, yeah. it's got some, yeah, some rubber in it. So, so they were talking um, that the timeline to do it through the traditional injection molding process was going to be like months, Five, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, yes, several months. And, and to be able to do it uh, with a 3d printing method, which means you skip the injection part, you skip the mold creation you prototype but then you just mm -hmm. directly 3d print with the um w whatever materials y y the parts made of and it's they're doing, um, what like sixty thousand of them in five weeks yeah yeah it's just uh, insane because it requires two per vehicle and in order for them to get the vehicles out in time for production that's how many they needed. And like you said, with the lead times, it was just going to be impossible to meet that. So they just took the matter in their own hands. I, I see this happening more and more. Now, I can tell you that it's expensive. The reason yeah. it's not done more right now is those parts are going to cost more than they would through the injection molding process. Mm -hmm. But GM went, well, selling no cars is even yeah. more expensive. So let's right. take the hit on the parts. Down pr production time, down production time cost right. them a fortune because of uh, uh, labor um, that, that are just, they're having to pay labor. It's not their fault. You know, right. so they, again, I've, I've said this before, when you are supplying the OEM, they jump in front um, because they have these contractual agreements in place that if they do not meet that just in time order, for production and that production line goes down, they are heavily fined by the manufacturer themselves. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what all the circumstances are around this, but GM just stepping up to the plate and saying, okay, uh, our, we, we're looking at the numbers here. Um, us doing this on our own is going to get these vehicles produced and it's going to, at the end, it's going to affect our bottom line uh, qu quite uh, well, quite heavily and by honestly, getting it done. Uh, if they don't sell them now, they may not sell them at all. With fuel prices continuing to go up, mm -hmm. the, these big engines are going to take a hit in sales by the oh, end of the year. Are. And so they, they got to get these things off the lot, right? So to speak, or out of the out of the where out of the factory. Yeah, that's a good point you bring up because again, remember GM is going all electric uh, by 2035. They say so they are they're going to continue to make some internal combustion engines. Um, but, you know, even with all the electrical problems that some of these EVs are having, um, you know, I still see them pushing hard. But if I am someone waiting to go buy an EV, I'm still of the mindset that I like to wait a few generations before I go buy something. Yeah. That's just me. Yeah. You know, wait for the and, solid and, state battery. Right. right. And e yeah. And EV is not going to be the answer to the to the to the problem, I think, overall. It's only just one small piece of it. And. You know, there there's still I think room for for internal the internal combustion engine on this planet um, for for a period of time, man. I, I just don't see it completely going. I don't see how right. it can. I agree. So, yeah. but you know, but GM innovation got in a bind. Let's do this. What will this do for future auto manufacturers? They're going to take a look at what GM just did, and they're going to go, hey, you know, well maybe we should invest into it, and and do the same thing they did for certain components. Now, while that may put the smaller companies in China out of business, that might be a good point of light for them to steer on because maybe now you can truly make these things in America, American made, like people are wanting to see more of. It's just not that easy to do. Um, right. So COVID, supply chain disruptions, all these things that are going and going on and that are happening with, with the inflation and potential recession happening, I think there's going to be a reboot of, of supply uh, chain um, in, the, in the next decade. There's going to be a, a reboot of a lot of things. And, you know, I, I had this thought before we, we, we started recording this today. I thought, you know, 
re recessions can be rough and you know it's not fun to think about when you're you know ha you're trying to support even if it's just yourself or you have a family and you're trying to put food on the table and you're worried about you know losing a job and you mm -hmm. know that that's stressful as it is but on the other hand you know we've got so much like waste right now where we're just buying things out of control and it's stupid crap that most of us don't need and mm -hmm. you know w we've got to the point that manufacturers don't have to put the quality control in that they need to you know you talked about your apple airpods mm -hmm. uh are on this many times you guys have watched and seen videos that jay and i shoot and produce and there are two primary workhorses that we have. Jay has a Sony and I have a Canon and I have professionally shot with Canon equipment my whole life. And we have a problem right now with the Canon in that if you try to shoot in 4K for more than 15 minutes, the Canon, it overheats and shuts down. And that is a known problem. They've tried to patch it with firmware updates. It, it has not fixed the problem. It's all over the internet. Everybody knows about it. It's, it's common and Canon has not stepped up and offered to repair or replace those those cameras in a different economic time. They would be forced to do so. And I feel right. like sometimes you have to reset things, even though it's a bitter pill. Right. You know, even with COVID and all these supply chain disruptions and stuff, there's, you know, these manufacturers are still putting product out, new product out. And that's how they stay in the game. The minute you you're not continuing to put stuff out, uh, and changing, you know, just take GoPro for as a fine example. Yeah. They're they're putting something out every, you know, they can't let one thing alone. They got to change it and change the they battery. Gotta, it's just they're worried about not being relevant anymore. Yeah. Exactly, which makes sense. I get it, but at the same time, the, the consumer is the one that that really, you know, takes the hit. Um, at the end of the day, my guess on your Canon is the same thing that has happened to Ford and uh, many of these others. It's supply chain issues where they had to go to a different source for a specific component that has caused these things to do it. And in the right situations, rather than quality control them like you do because you're the owner, um, they they didn't they didn't do their due diligence as far as that goes. I mean, and I think that's why they're, re they're when overheating. The, so. When the bulletin from the manufacturer says, reset the clock, make sure you're in the right time zone, take the battery out and wait 90 minutes, that's not a solution. Me no. interrupting a photo shoot for 90 minutes while my mm -hmm. camera cools down is not okay. But I digress. So um, I've got a suggestion here, and I can do this in a kind of a unique way. We were, we were There's a couple more things we wanted to talk about. How about, would you be okay with, Jay, if we closed out on Rivian? We, we get into a little bit of some Rivian news yes. that, that Sounds comes good. along with kind of the changing it absolutely times. fits right in here. I agree with you, yes. And, and coming up on the next podcast, everybody, and this is why you need to make sure you're subscribed, um, we're going to get into a little bit of a, of a de potential death of dealerships. And mm -hmm. Ford is one of the people leading the charge from the old school on that. And this right. is something that we've brought up before. I hate to say I told you so. And it is coming. And this the the economic times may may speed it along a little bit. So we're gonna probably get into that on the next podcast. Make sure you're subscribed. How do you do that? Go over to our website, partscannerguru.com. Click on the podcast tab. Pick the favorite podcast platform of of yours, whether that's Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google. Uh, who, Jay? Whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, we're on all of them. Yeah. Tune in, Stitcher. Tune in, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Apple, Google. Yeah. Yeah. You named them all. We're, or we're there. Or you can just go to your smart device and say, play the Parts, Parts Counter Gurus podcast, and he or she will do it, depending on if you've chosen the male or female voice. But yeah, right. they'll, they'll all do it. Anyway, so uh, Rivian, who we've also been a fan of, but a little bit of tough love here, um, mm -hmm. just lost a major player. They in, sure did. In their, uh, it's their head of manufacturing, and mm -hmm. they've already been troubled with production issues. Yep. Previously discussed supply chain stuff. Um, you know, ramping up, never having done an assembly line before this R1T, having to right. learn the hard way on a lot of that. Yep. Uh, Tesla went through the same thing. You know, you're not making enough models fast enough you can't break even because you can literally sell more than you can make right so um <clears throat> rj himself made the announcement uh but did it through a, like an internal company email 
Right. And I don't know how to say Charlie's last name. I, I'm, I'm going to go with Mwangi. Okay. Mwangi. Mwangi. Charlie, if you're out there, feel free to contact us. We'll uh, give us the correct uh, pronunciation of that. You've been His- with Rivian uh, since spring of 2020, which was really when they started to put parts on an assembly line to, to put them together in the form of a truck or an SUV. Right. Right. He worked at Tesla before. Yep. Yep. He was an engineering executive, we said, right? I believe so. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, funny, we're just talking supply shortage issues. And lo and behold, who who's who might be in charge of those supply shortage issues? This guy. And, and yeah, <laughs> you know. So there's a couple possibilities here. One could be that, you know, he got a better opportunity. You know, I have my doubts on that. I mean, it's possible, and we don't know. But think about it from the perspective of whoever would be offering him that said better opportunity. You don't really look at the guy's current position and go, well, you're at Rivian and you're in the middle of tons of supply chain issues and we're not seeing a lot of great success out of that. Why don't we go ahead and offer you this better job so that you can come to our company and stumble the same way that you stumbled there? I I just don't see, could be wrong, don't see that being the case. No, neither do I. And it also could be that that, that ownership... um, shareholders, stockholders are not on the same page as this gentleman um, and want to go in a different direction to remedy the problem. Um, That happens a lot in large corporations where uh, they're just not on the same page and they decide to just move on. And that could very well be what the case is here. Or he may have health issues. He, or he just might be wanting to get out of the game, period, because he's had enough. He could be an aging person. I, yep. I don't, we don't know the He could be the going uh, Kevin Spacey in American Beauty, and you just see him in a drive through <laughs> coming right, soon, right? Man. I mean, right. there's so. tons of, yeah, there's lots of details we don't have. Right. But no matter how you slice it, this is going to be a challenging situation for Rivian. Right. It will be, and they, they also announced, though, Keith, that, they had uh, several organizational changes to align Rivian for the continued growth that they have coming. And that's it. I mean, that this is one of the things that you and I said that we like so much about Rivian or the CEO, RJ Scarange, is his transparency with um, uh, the development of the company and its progress of the company and, you know, what is it, its intent is. And he has blundered a couple of times, but he's owned it and come back and dealt with it. And now here's another situation. Um, they're they're going to be restructuring uh, an alignment of uh, their operations team led by their new chief operations officer, Frank Klein. Um, he will be joining Rivian on June 1. Yes, um, and there's a reason behind was, this. Please, right? please uh, get to that. You're about to get okay. to that. I know you are, right? Mr. Klein will oversee production, uh, manufacturing, engineering, and supply chain. And why is that? Because they ramped production up towards a 2022 target of 25,000 vehicles. And um, they are confident, they say, that these changes will strengthen the ability uh, to be able to more efficiently engage new and existing customers, extend the product offering, and deepen the relationship with commercial partners. Now, the, that right there in itself, you got to know that they're big players. They're commercial partners. Amazon, right? Uh, who are they? Right. I've not heard of them. They are a huge investor. There hasn't been one in my house in at least an hour. I mean. (laughs) Right. Oh, I think I've seen three today, you know, not to my, you know, just in my area. Yeah. Not only a commercial investor, a customer. (laughs) It's like that guy that bought the razor company, Jay. Right. Right. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But look, they're splitting their commercial and retail side. You know that, right? Yes. Rivian That's has what I was trying to, to get you and to you were, let the cat and out. And you were going to get into that. So get into that a little bit. No, What's that's the, fine. You got into it. So the case, <laughs> the case made there is I think that they really have to, they need to focus on a couple of things, but they need to they need to share the focus just as much on one as the other. They don't need to take their eye off either, either ball here. Are, do you really want to make Amazon the largest, world's largest supplier of consumer goods? Do you want to make them wait in line for their order of vans until after you've caught up with your R1T manufacturing? Which, by the way, r- right, you don't. 
And, you know, Rivian's in the middle of a contract dispute with a seat supplier that has an effect on those vans, by the way. And that's why some of their shares, uh, the, the price on their shares dropped so abruptly as well. Which, by the way, guys, just keep paying attention to the Rivian stock. It's going to come back. And I, just pay attention to it. I mean, I don't, you know, I know we have, I know we have this, um, this ensuing recession, uh, uh, you know, co- coming or, or uh, excuse me, impending. Right. Right. That's coming. Um, but stocks may save your life. This I mean, might be one of them. I don't I, know. I can see I, in jest. I, I can see the telephone conversations going on on those uh, uh, supply issues with the seats for the Amazon vans. Right. Like I right. can picture RJ Scarringe on the phone with that seat manufacturing company. And they're basically telling him, like, we can't do it. And he goes, hey, uh, do you know who Jeff Bezos is? I know Jeff. He owns rockets. Do you want me to tell Jeff to have one of those rockets land on your house? I mean, this could go or or how would you like a trip to space? All you have to do <laughs> is get us those seats in time. And I right. guarantee you a seat in Jeff's next whatever. Right. right? Like, can you just see the kind of ridiculous Look, like what's it going to take? Right. And that, exactly. And that's why they're but that's why they're driving those Rivians out to the launch pad, too. So there you right. go. I mean, there, there's a there's a whole big partnership with this thing. And yes, you know that Scarringe is going to be taking care of uh, Jeff. So, well, you know, we'll see how far cowboy that goes. Hat but and all. Yeah. Cowboy hat and all. But but just know that, um, you know, at the end of the day, every manufacturer out there is not immune, no matter what you're producing. It doesn't matter if it's an all electric vehicle, uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. Commercial vehicles, diesel, refrigerator, washing machine, it does not matter. Canon, uh, cam- cameras, Apple AirPods, the, the, it, the list goes on and on and on for supply chain problems. And I believe that's why we're starting to see a lot more quality issues. I said this. I said this. Pay attention. Did not. I hate to say I told you so. You remember the podcast that we talked about, and I said, just be careful, guys. The stuff sitting out there. If I'm you guys, I'd hold off on buying any vehicles until we get past this mess because you don't know what you're going to get. Clearly, I you didn't know. listen. I have a very large diesel pusher on order, which has been that can's been kicked down the street so many times Ooh. that I'm kind of to the point now where I'm just like, I, I, I at least was able to. Position the agreement to the to the extent that I can walk away with no mm-hmm. monetary penalty. Right. So if they keep well, that's good. they keep yanking my chain at some point, we're done. And hey, pal, I just keep what ho- I've got. Hotel rooms are a lot cheaper. Uh have you looked lately? Uh yeah, I've stayed mean, in them. Not the I strat, mean, but you know, like yeah, Well Yeah, uh, they're we're, high. Do, we're about mean, to do that at the end of this month and it's you know, for oh, ones know. that you I, won't get mugged in, they're not, you know. I just stayed in, in one for three nights in Florida. Uh, my bill was over $700. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I know it's not cheap. I got to, I'm going to be in Houston um, it, for an extended period of time. Plus, it's cost me nearly 1000 I got my own bed, bathroom, podcasting studio. I, uh, yeah, I know. You know. I know. I get it. But right now, man. Three TVs, you know, kitchen. Well, Fridge with beer. What do we got? We got shrinkflation going on right now, right? Yeah. Boxes, getting, boxes yeah. of stuff are going down and size and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 We'll see. I it, I think it's a. This is a, an, another podcast, but I think the the RV industry did not learn a damn thing from the last recession, and they are lighting cigars with hundred dollar bills right now, and they have mm-hmm. this don't care attitude, and yep. fuel prices are through the roof, and they are about to crash, and they st- and they still like. The plane ran out of fuel about an hour ago, and they've been like hang gliding over the the you know Grand Canyon, and they right. still don't. There's not like it's like party on, you know. Whew. Crazy man. How how would Boomhauer address that, Keith? Uh, how would he address this particular situation? I don't know, man. He's got so many. Uh, you know, take a dip in a take a dip in a. Yeah, well, that's I think so. Been, right. I have a pretty good dang old idea what's going on. I tell you what, man. It. All... Um, I love it. Yeah. So yeah. So that that's the you know, that's the gi- that's the that's the gist. I we're the gist. One thing is for sure, Jay. Uh, you know, when things get tough, you'll always have us to talk this to you. This is true. About them, talk this is absolutely them. true. 
what, whatever the free. case may be, as long as you go over to our website and you subscribe to the podcast. And by the way, mm-hmm. while you're there, click the Amazon link and buy something. Please do. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of asking. Right. And start looking at our videos because yeah. we, 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 we're going to have links down there and, and that you, you're going to be surprised. There's going to be some things available to you. So just keep, no, keep, I'm not, I'm not tired of asking. I'm just, I'm kidding. Keep, but, yeah. keep thank, watching and, and support those of you that are, there are a lot of people that are. Yes. Yes. Uh, and absolutely. over on the YouTube side. Yep. As always, we're, we're there. YouTube.com for slash parts kind of gurus. We're on socials too. We're on Facebook.com for slash parts kind of gurus. Instagram.com for slash the parts kind of gurus. We're over on Twitter at the counter show. So join us. Have you join the ride? We're getting uh, a lot more we're, riders we're, on the train on the we're Twitter side. We're starting to get yeah, the, the train is filling up. Yeah. Pal. Get your tickets, guys. Get your tickets. I got to be careful, Aren't man. I, I now, see now it's like all this pressure. Like the more followers you get, the more pressure you have to not do something stupid. Right. You know, right. when there's just 10 people watching, it's not a big deal. Right. But when when it's thousands of people and, you know, yeah. You're kind of hanging it out there. It's, uh, mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, this isn't this isn't jackass, right? So it's <laughs> right. However, there is some jackassery that may <laughs> may occur while we're on the air, but but anyway, yes. Yeah, so, so that's um, that's a wrap, pal. This has been a great show today. Thank you for joining me as usual, man. I I, I we this is my therapy session is now over. I'm good. I'm uh, so now now what I need from my therapist is something that I can go home with and, and take with me, and, and it's my homework. So give it to me, great one. Um, okay, but before I do, just in closing, I wanted to mention um, something. So now that you have gone through what you went through over the past few weeks, mm-hmm. if I go first, I want you to dig the hole. Okay. Not because, like, you know, we have a relationship and I love you or anything like that. Just, Just because, because I have the experience. I have the, the experience. only one that I trust to do it right. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> you got it. I'll take that. I'll take that um, That honor. I'll yeah. have that honor. Yeah. There you go. I mean, I don't That's care good. if the, it's empty or, and there's, like, the ashes end up in, like, a, you know... Right. Shot right. from a cannon like puff weed or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, just saying. You got okay. it. <laughs> All right. I'll take care of you, man. So this one is for everybody out there, but probably also especially for Jim Farley and RJ Scarringe, uh, just because I feel like it might apply to them um, as well as the rest of us. And here it is. The dark moments help you appreciate the bright ones. So remember that the next time things get tough. Without those dark moments there would be no appreciation of the bright ones. Wow. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for making us a part of your regular lives. That's my pal Jay over there. I'm Keith. We will see you on the next one.